Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Actual Cell Therapy Lecture Series. I'm Estella, and the host for the lecture today. Sorry, my video cam is uh, not functioning well, so please pardon me that I'll be speaking without my camera on. Today, we have Dr. Chen to speak to us on practical considerations in delivering CAR T cell therapies in Singapore. 
Dr. Chen is a consultant hematologist at Singapore General Hospital. She specializes in care of patients with multiple myeloma and lymphoma proliferative disorders. She was trained at the Rene Brennan's lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where she was involved in developing novel cellular therapeutics for treatment of multiple myeloma as well as myeloma CAR T cell clinical trials. Within the Singhal Duke NUS Cell Therapy Center, she's the education co lead and clinical deputy lead of adult blood cancer. She has been involved in developing the clinical CAR T cell program at Singhealth Ultron Campus and deriving patient correlatives to improve prognostic and monitoring capabilities. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Chen. Dr. Chen, please. Thank you, Adela, for the introduction. And I also like to thank, um, hang on, thank actress for inviting me for today. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for spending your time with us this afternoon. So I'm a clinician hematologist in SGH. In my day-to-day -day work, I see patients with lymphoma and myeloma, as mentioned, the two conditions for which CAR T cell therapies are now approved in. And hence today I'm here and I'm happy to share some of the practical pointers that saw us through the delivery of CAR T cell therapy to our patients. And today, my, the title of my talk is Practical Considerations in Delivering CAR T cell therapies in Singapore. So these are my disclosures and some disclaimers. The premise to my talk is that CAR T cell therapies for the treatment of relapsed BALL and certain B cell lymphomas and multiple myeloma are now FDA approved. However, delivering these commercial CAR T cells outside the scope of clinical trials actually require intricate planning of resource and infrastructural allocation, as well as meeting specific clinical, administrative, and regulatory demands. A successful CAR T cell program depends on bringing together various expertise. I understand the audience mix is quite a mix today, so these are the outline of which I will cover today. The first I will cover a brief background of landmark developments and where we currently stand in terms of CAR T cell developments. The second part, I'll be sharing more about the practical delivery of a CAR T cell program, taking from some current best practices worldwide, and also talking a little bit about the ex CAR T cell experience we're having at SGH thus far. The last part, I'll be talking a little bit about building a translational CAR T cell program. So without further ado, I will just lead us on into my talk. If you were to take a look at the history of developments of CAR T cell, I think this only went back to about 1990s, where the first generation CARs were um, looked into. Of course, those weren't very effective because they only had a single co-stimulatory domain. So since then, second generation CARs were developed um, in terms of having two co-stimulatory domains. And the first investigational drug was NTCD19 CARs. 2017 saw the FDA approval of the first CAR T cell therapy in the use of ALL, uh, T cell cell as we now know it today, or Naya. And thereafter, it's followed by um, two um, others in the realm of B cell lymphomas. In terms of myeloma CAR T cell development, it lags a little bit behind the B cell, lymph uh, B -cell lymphoma, such as ALL and DLBCL. But this year, we saw the FDA approval of IDA cell for the use in myeloma. Currently, we now have five products, CAR T cell products, that are being approved for the use in various conditions, such as BAL and B cell lymphoma or T cell. Um, there are a few other products that have seen developments along the last few years. Most of these products are approved in the relapsed refractory setting, and I'll cover a little bit more about these in, later on. Moving on, we have seen many, many clinical trials in terms of CAR T cell developments, even outside of the lymphoid and myeloma re uh, realms. Now we are seeing more developments in terms of solid tumors, and we can only say that we hope that the CAR T cell therapy will kick off and change the landscape in terms of cancer immunotherapy. So what's the issue with CAR T cell right now? The current approved CAR T cell therapies are autologous CAR T cell therapies. What it means is that T cells are collected from patients themselves. They are extracted and undergo a period of um, genetic engineering in the lab, whereby they are attached um, the chimeric antigen receptors are attached to the CAR T cells such that they have SCFVs that can recognize and um, counteract the antigens on the cancer cells themselves. Hence, the whole process involves a few um, steps that prove to be a clinical challenge, including that of nucleophoresis, subsequent manufacturing, and also the infusion itself. In this paper that was uh, published by the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where they talk about building a car garage, um, they brought up some points that I found to be very interesting. And it's that now we are faced with the administrative and logistic challenge of delivering CAR T cell outside the scope of clinical trials. And it's due to the attention in the scientific and lay press that has led to tremendous excitement and high demand. 
However, the actual meeting of these expectations will be a challenge because patients may assume that they are broad access to these products in a similar fashion to other chemotherapeutic agents that we are used to. However, CAR T cells will only be limited to certain centers that are actually certified by the manufacturers and provided to patients who fulfill strict label requirements. And it is indeed a significant undertaking. I think we are not unfamiliar with the press attention that has brought to CAR T cell even in Singapore. We all have heard of Oscar, the British boy who came to Singapore with, um, and CAR T cell was infused to the patients. Um, there was a press release when he went home after six months after CAR T cell treatment in a great state. And recently, we saw that one year later, he still remains disease-free. Of course, we also saw um, the approval and the, of Kisa cell in Singapore, and now it's being used in uh, the clinical setting. The, as we set up our regenerative medicine and cell therapy center in Singha, this was also publicized in the press. So how do we justify how this is meeting the demands? I think there are some many clinical trials that have proved that the efficacy of CAR T cell. I will bring up some. First, we'll talk about DLBCL. This is a survival outcomes of patients with relapsed DLBCL outside the use of CAR T cell therapy. And you can see that in patients who have relapsed DLBCL, the median survival is only about 10 months. Even in the younger patients who are less than 65 years, this is only about a miserable 24 months. And if we were to look at the five-year five year survival of these patients, it only ranges from about 20 over percent to about 40 percent. So the Zuma Long trial, which is um, the CAR T cell trial involving XC cell, has recently published the long-term safety and efficacy data. And we see that the curve of these patients have plateaued, which means that in a significant proportion of patients, about uh, 40 to 50 percent, they actually possibly have been cured of their disease. And this is a, quite a stark remark, um, achievement in patients who have relapsed refractory DLBCL. Also in the myeloma setting, whereby another CAR T cell therapy has been FDA approved, we can see from the MEMA study, which has published, uh, uh, which is a publication on the monoclonal antibodies in multiple myeloma outcomes of the therapy failure. We see in that triple or quad refractory patients, which is defined as patients who are refractory to one proteasome inhibitor, one emate, and at least um, one monoclonal antibody, the median overall survival is only about nine months, and patients who are penta refractory is only about five months. If we were to look at responses of this group of um, refractory patients, and in myeloma setting, we always talk about patients achieving BGPR or CR and better, it's only about 10%. We have seen recent data published on CAR T cell therapy in the myeloma setting. And the first drug that was approved in this setting is either cell. And this is the recently published, again, a phase two data of either cell um, of patients who are treated with uh, 150 million or more CAR T cells. And the overall response rates in these patients, as compared to the previous um, paper that we see, more than 50% of them achieve BGPR or better. And median over survival in this almost similar refractory patient group is reaching about 20 months. Another CAR T cell therapy being in, um, examined in the myeloma setting is SILTA cell. And in the CAR TITUDE 1 study, where patients with relapsed refractory myeloma are treated, again, we see very stark responses with about over 95% of the patients achieving VGPR or better. And as you can see, this patient group has almost like 40% 40, 40 of patients who are penta drug refractory and 85% of patients who are triple class refractory. And if I were to bring you back to the previous study, only about 10% 10 10 of patients achieve VGPR or better. Some survival data is now out, and we can see that in patients who have achieved stringent CR with CAR T cell therapy in this group, their 18 month progression free survival is upwards of 75%, which means that three quarters of these patients um, remain progression free at 18 months. And I think to me, as a myeloma um, treating physician, this is actually quite amazing results for a, pat for a patient group which is very relapse refractory. And hence, at this point, I would like to say that CAR T cell therapy has emerged as one of the latest breakthrough of cancer immunotherapies offering hope to patients with actually very few treatment options. And the delivery of CAR T cell therapy differs from that of traditional chemotherapeutic agents and requires fair amount of forward planning to ensure accessibility to patients who need it most. The next part of my talk, I will actually talk about the practical aspects, how a CAR T cell program is being run. The difficulty in CAR T cell, delivering CAR T cell therapy is because of the complexities in terms of delivery. First, usually the patients have to undergo um, evaluation and determination of suitability. Subsequently, when we have determined that the patients um, have gone, have, are suitable and have uh, indication to receive CAR T cell therapy, this is ordered with the manufacturer. They undergo what we call apheresis, and then the cells collected are shipped out for genetic modification and expansion. Thereafter, these cells are shipped back to the patients. Patients undergo a period of lymphodepletion before the CAR T cells are infused to the patient. 
of course, thereafter follows a period of pharmacovigilance and outcome monitoring. So I, 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 I phrase it like a few with, uh, points of contact. First, the determination of eligibility and suitability. Second phase, the preparatory phase, where we collect out the T cells. The third phase is that of manufacture. And of course, the fourth, fourth phase is the administration and monitoring of these CAR T cell therapies. And it really involves a multidisciplinary team. What people have um, done is to say that, of course, the foundation must be laid before we even start to embark on this process. And how this is done is through building a team, meeting local licensing regulations, and also through accreditation. The team is made up of key stakeholders. So it is a special team of physicians dedicated to CAR T cell therapies. This differs from institutions to institutions. Some institutions worldwide will have a separate clinical unit, example, a cellular therapy unit that administer CAR T cells. Some institutions will administer CAR T cells through the transplant program, but the best practice is always to limit the number of physicians that administer CAR T cells such that they gain the adequate exposure and experience with the administration. Of course, this is not all. There will need to be a multidisciplinary physicians, including the MICU physicians, the neurologists, the ID physicians on board, dedicated coordinators, nurse navigators, a dedicated nursing service, pharmacists, as well as collection facilities and processing facilities. Most places leverage on the bone marrow transplant program, and this is because of a few factors. One is that the current approved therapies are in the him malignancy sphere, and hence it um, interests the bone marrow transplant, trans transplanters in that sense. Secondly, there's also a lot of similarities in logistical setup as that of an autologous stem cell transplant. Also, with regards to the familiarity with coordination and monitoring and established support network that has been set up in a bone marrow transplant program. Why do I say that it has some logistical similarities to that of autologous stem cell transplant? When we do an autologous stem cell transplant for conditions such as lymphoma and myeloma, patients are first treated with induction. And as they respond, we go through a period where we call stem cell mobilization, where the stem cells are extracted out, stored, and then subsequently patients undergo a period of stem cell transplant where they are um, treated with um, high dose chemotherapy to um, do away with the cancer cells. And along that, the good cells get affected as well. The stem cells are then reinfused to the patients and they proliferate to give rise to stem cell reco um, the recovery of the different hematopoietic products in the patient's bone marrow. In a similar fashion, autologous CAR T cell therapy kind of follows a simil similar logistical setup in that patients are treated with salvaged chemotherapy. They undergo a period of what we call peripheral blood mononuclear cell collection. These cells are collected, stored. The T cells themselves are engineered such that the CAR itself is engineered onto the T cells. These are infused back to the patients, which act against the cancer cell itself. So a lot of people leverage on the bone marrow transplant program. As the disease indication will expand, we cannot just rely on the core clinical cellular therapeutics team. We need other disease-specific leads. In particular, in the solid cancer realm, a lot more indications might come up for in terms of CAR T cell therapy. Of course, we always rely on our ICU, ID, neurologists to provide support. And as we take on the, the outpatient CAR T cell therapy, the emergency department also comes in as well. We need a lot of allied health um, professionals on board as well in terms of coordination, the pharmacists to help with um, drug checking and also to fulfill the wash-up periods, nursing care, the cell processing, lab, laboratory-wise, that um, contacts with the regulatory authority, the finance, MSW and manufacturer, right, and so on. And hence, the whole team needs to be put in place. Besides this, there also needs to be accreditation done by recognized agency. What this does is that it gives assurance that, um, that the, the institution is in fact um, established enough and well, well poised to carry out CAR T cell therapy. And for this, there are certain accreditation um, agency in excess. And at SGH, we are both FACT and JC accredited. It assures that the quality of the program and also secondly, assists in helping to improve the institution or the program. And it has been shown in many other studies to improve the outcomes of patients who are treated with um, both stem cell transplant and cellular therapy. Thirdly, before we embark on, um, on the delivery of CAR T cell, licensing regulations are important. So in Singapore, the HSA has promulgated new regulations for cell, tissue, and gene therapy products under the Health Products Act. And this framework facilitates clinical development, manufacturing, registration, and includes long-term follow-up of safety and efficacy for novel and innovative cell therapy and gene therapy products. When all is set in place, we will take the patient on a CAR T cell patient journey. And this involves these processes, the patient selection and evaluation, CAR T cell order to the manufacturer, the collection and shipment of the 
um, leukapheresis product, the reception of the CAR T cell, subsequently the prescription and dispensing of CAR T cell, followed by the pharmacovigilance and monitoring and the record of outcomes. I will bring us through some of these steps and the points to take note of. In terms of patient selection and evaluation, um, before the start of CAR T cell therapy, most of the time these patients go through what we call multidisciplinary, uh, that are discussed at a multidisciplinary meeting. What this does is that we determine that the patient needs approved indication for the usage of cellular therapy, and we also coordinate the subsequent clinical management comprehensively. And usually at this meeting, there's a hematologist, oncologist, who serves as the primary point of contact. The critical care, neurologist, ID physician, radi radiation oncologist, and nursing team are also there to assess the suitability and whether the patient needs earlier review by any of them. For example, if they were to known to have some uh, baseline uh, CNS, CNS involvement. The pharmacist comes on board as well to check the indications are met and does met reconciliation. The coordinators, of, coordinators are extremely important to us at this point of time because they coordinate the entire care pathway. At this point, in parallel, we usually also send the patients to do what we call a financial assessment. As we know, CAR T cell therapy is costly. Later, I will touch on this point. And hence, this is extremely important to seek whether they can afford the CAR T cell therapy itself. I briefly touched on this slide previously. Um, so there are different indications um, um, specific to each products. And I think usually before we start a patient, we must on, on the CAR T cell therapy, we make sure that they fulfill the indications for the CAR T cell therapy itself. As you can see um, for XCL, it is not indicated for the use of primary CNS lymphoma at this point of time. There has been recent in, um, approvals of Takatas or Brexocell in the setting of relapsed refractory mental cell lymphoma and either cell in the setting of relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. And this is only after more than more, um, four or more prior lines of therapy, including an uh, immunomodulator, a proteasome inhibitor, and an uh, NTCD38 monoclonal antibody. How we determine whether a patient can go on to receive CAR T cell therapy? We look at a few things, including patient factors. Fitness is the most important criteria. At this point, um, I think worldwide, the uh, age itself is not a barrier. There are some CAR T cell trials where patients more than 80 years, um, about 80 years or so, have even gone on to receive CAR T cell therapy. Of course, we look at their renal, pulmonary, and cardiac functions and make sure that they have no active infections. We determine, in a way, T cell health. Um, of course, it is not so simple to determine T cell health. There are a few parameters we look at um, in terms of counts, absolute lymphocyte counts, to see whether or not um, the success of manufacturing CAR T cell is feasible. And with that, um, then we determine on whether or not the patient can go on to receive the treatment itself. For patients with absolute lymphocytes counts of less than 0.15, um, usually this predicts that they do not respond as well. Um, I mean, the, the, the manufacturing processes may have issues and hence a suggestion for no or delayed collection. There are also disease factors we look at. As mentioned, we make sure that they meet disease indications. There are certain specific exclusions, such as active CNS involvement, and also some predictors of poor response that might make us want to uh, consider not giving CAR T cell to this group of patients, such as having very, very bulky disease, um, especially if they are resistant to a lot of different treatments. In terms of treatment factors, we also heavily determine on whether the product is actually accessible to us. And currently in Singapore, we have only one single product, the TISA cell being commercially avail uh, available. If we have many products to choose from, then we will go on to compare the efficacy and toxicity data. What I mean is, um, I will refer to this chart. So in this chart, in, in an ideal world where we have um, different CAR T cell products being available, for example, XC cell and TISA cell and Lysol cell, as we know, these three products are approved in the setting of um, B cell lymphomas, the LBCLs um, and other high-grade lymphoma. So how then do we decide which therapy to give to our patients? People have looked at different toxicities. Um, although in the Zuma Wow trial, for which XC cell is done, uh, the CRS grading is slightly different from that done in the Juliet trials, and hence it might not be comparable. If we were to look at Liso cell versus XC cell, we can see higher grades of CRS toxicities in the XC cell group, and this has been postulated to be possibly related to the effect of the co-stimulatory domain being CD28 instead of 41 bb in TISA cell and Lyso cell, and the postulation that CD28 gives off a stronger and faster signal than that of 41 bb And hence, in some centers, in the more elderly patients and in the outpatient settings, they avoid XC cell and prefer the TISA cell as well as Lyso cell. But of course, uh, this will only be possible if we have different products being available. You can also see that the CRS, time to CRS is shorter in XC cell as compared to TISA cell and Lyso cell. 
And hence, knowing all this gives us greater confidence when we manage patients, we have expectations and kind of predict when such toxicities may happen. In terms of cell correction, the apheresis is the process whereby we collect T cells and ensure traceability as we send off these cells overseas for the production. Um, to explain to some of the audience who might not be so familiar, um, apheresis is a process where the blood is removed through a needle, a catheter, and circulated into a blood cell separator machine, almost like this. Sometimes we refer it to similar to our patient undergoes dialysis in that sense. The components that can be separated include plasma, platelets, and leukocytes. And in this case, for CAR T cell therapy, we refer to leukophoresis. The separated cells are transferred to a collection bag. The red blood cells are returned to the patients through a return needle. The optimal, collection, the optimal time for collection of CAR T cell therapy remains unknown. Um, and the optimal amount of CAR T, um, T cells to be collected also remains unknown. Uh, the current protocols require approximately 12 to 15 liters of blood to be processed with a goal of obtaining 5 to 10 billion mononuclear cells. The minimum absolute lymphocyte count will actually vary by manufacturer. Some products such as T cell cells set specification values that needs to be met before the T cells are deemed suitable for production. Disease in the peripheral blood is generally not an exclusion criteria. We see this because in patients such as BALL, even despite the circulating uh, disease, they can still go on to receive CAR T cell therapy, and some of them still have very good responses as well. The patient also needs to have suitable access for apheresis and may require a central line. One of the notes that one of the things that we need to note is that washout periods are required before apheresis. Um, in terms of steroids, this is three days, and it's because steroids are known to reduce the circulating lymphocyte counts. There are other factors, um, washout periods to be met. Of course, um, this varies. Well. This is still a work in progress, but um, there are many uh, protocols to refer to in that sense. After the collection, the cells are collected, we go through a cell production shipment tray. This goes from the patient to the collection, and they are bio storage or packed in terms of fresh cells, transported. Transport can mean to a site that is uh, locally produced, or it can mean to overseas sites where the cells undergo a period of manufacture and then transported back to the center of infusion, stored again, and then reinfused to the patient. Of course, because this involves various pathways of transfers and receiving of this CAR T cell therapy, what is important is to maintain a chain of identity. Some of these products go to overseas, and hence data privacy is another aspect that is being looked at. Um, and they need to maintain uh, traceability throughout this whole process. These are autologous T cells, and hence they go from the patient to manufacturer and back to the patients. And hence, this maintenance of chain of identity is very, very important. Before the infusion of CAR T cell um, itself, some patients go through what we call bridging therapy. Bridging therapy is defined as the treatment that is given after leukophoresis and before the lymphodepleting chemotherapy. Since the manufacturing time, for CAR T cell manufacture may vary. It can vary from three weeks to eight weeks. This is an evolving field as manufacturing capabilities improve and patients may or may not require bridging. Should we bridge patients on, uh, before um, the receiving of the CAR T cell itself? Most of the time, this is done to stabilize the disease and to prevent rapid progression of the disease and to ensure that the patient is at optimal fitness at the time of CAR T cell infusion. What people have bridged with, uh, RT is quite commonly used, um, especially if it's localized disease. For lymphomas, some of the regimens that people use to bridge uh, patients include RGDP, Colabr, Ibrutinib, and lenalidomide. And how much to bridge is relatively controversial in a sense, because induction of remission is controversial. Um, some, there are some groups of thoughts where the inadequate T cell activation, because without adequate antigen stimulation, there may be inadequate T cell activation, and hence treating a patient to remission may prevent the CAR T cells from being expanded to fulfill their purposes in the patient themselves. Um, so finally, we have some studies to suggest that bridging might not be that beneficial. Of course, these are retrospective studies, and hence, usually patients who are less fit or have more aggressive disease tend to be the ones who are bridged, and hence, um, it's hard to compare. But what we know is that bridging, in patients who bridge, um, it can affect their survival outcomes. Some overseas centers have said that not every patient needs bridging, and in their practice, if they can avoid it, they will. There are certain pathways uh, proposed schemas for patients who receive bridging. Um, in terms of low disease, they will try to use low intensity bridging. Patients who have high disease burden can either receive bridging, uh, high, high treatment, uh, high intensity chemotherapy, but this is generally avoided because uh, 
as we can see, when we give patients high intensity chemotherapy, it increases their risk of high grade infections during the CAR T cell itself. And hence, there needs to be an adequate discussion with the patient as to whether they are suitable for going on to receive CAR T cell therapy. After bridging, uh, there are guidelines to say the period of washout periods before the CAR T cell infusion, and this needs to be adhered to. Although I must say this is still an evolving field, there are a lot of unanswered questions. People have asked whether RT can be used as a conditioning therapy. There is early preclinical evidence that suggests that actually low dose radiation induces tumor cell susceptibility to CAR T cell via trial expression and trial mediated care. And hence, whether there's a role of using low dose total nodal uh, irradiation or total body irradiation as part of a CAR T conditioning regimen. It's not proven clinically yet, and it's not yet clinically investigated, but it's supported by reports of disease progression only in diseased areas that are not irradiated before the CAR T cell therapy itself. Another ans an answered question is the role of medomite. This is an anecdotal um, report from a Chinese group to say that in a patient who has received two CAR T cell infusions, in the second infusion, where they um, gave the CAR T cells together with concurrently with lanidomide, there was increased CAR T cell expansion and persistence, suggesting that perhaps lanidomide has um, potentially aiding effects in CAR T cell therapy. Of course, we await further evidence before we uh, make further decisions or clinical guidance regarding these. So before the infusion itself, there's a period of reception storage. Um, this varies with hospitals. Sometimes it's kept with the cell therapy unit. Sometimes it's kept at the pharmacy. There's an important part called verification. Um, of course, this varies with hospitals, but it usually involves the doctors with either the cell therapy unit staff, the pharmacist. And the verification involves um, checking the packaging integrity, temperature compliance during transit, integrity and, uh, of the infusion bag. There needs to be identification and labeling, and also to see how many bags are received and the expir expiration dates. The administration itself, this involves again a multidisciplinary team. Most of the time before the lymphodepletion, the CAR T cell products needs to be verified to be on site before lymphodepletion can be administered in case there is any um, issues with regards to the delivery and the patient has already li received lymphodepletion already. Supportive therapies need to be uh, available, such as tocilizumab. The CAR T cell administration itself um, and the post-administration supportive care, this is usually done um, by the transplant team. So we know about the toxicities of CAR T cell ter therapies and how ameliorate those are through the use of either both SOPs as well as risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, what we call RAMS. What RAMS does, these are strategies to manage known or potential risk associated with a drug to ensure that the benefits actually outweigh the risk. And in the CAR T cell therapy, it's to mitigate the serious risk of CRS and neurologic toxicities. How we go about doing this is to ensure that the hospitals are specifically certified and have on-site immediate access to a minimum of two doses of tocilizumab. And also ensuring that those who prescribe, dispense, or administer CAR T cell are aware of how to manage the risk of CRS and neurologic toxicities. Of course, um, CAR T cell therapies, although it's similar to um, for example, uh, it's done in the transplant unit because it's similar to a bone marrow transplant in the sense in that the lymphodepleting therapies can cause the patients to go through a period of agranulocytosis and hence they require a period of um, infectious prophylaxis and uh, monitoring. But that is differ differs. It comes from the fact that as CAR T cell expands, they release chemokines and cytokines that peaks at about seven days or to 10 days or so. And these Cytokines or chemokines can lead to certain toxicities, for example, cytokine release syndrome, um, neurotoxicities, and also some liver dysfunctions. This, in a way, is not all bad because its effect is to reduce the tumor mass itself. Because of this, and because of other sensors' experience, there have been many SOPs um, that are developed that we follow closely to adhere uh, to nowadays. Um, the ASTCT uh, has now come up with a very, very simple grading for CRS um, if they have fever. No hypotension, hypoxia, they are great one. They have hypotension, but not requiring vasopressors or requiring just low flow um, nasal oxygen, they are great too. And grade three and four are uh, more severe in that sense. In this settings, corticosteroids are generally con contraindicated in the absence of life threatening complications because they can affect um, the CAR T cell expansion and also um, their subsequent effects. So, silizumab is generally given when patients have grade two or more um, CRS and in the more life-threatening situations, such as grade three or four, dexamethasone is given. In some situations, siltaximab is also considered if patient re remains refractory. 
in a similar fashion, um, there are guidelines in terms of um, immune cell effector associated neurotoxicities, like grading patients according to certain scores, such as the ICE score, and so responding to them um, in terms of different SOPs, which I will not go through in detail. At our center, we also came up with um, uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis guidelines in terms of giving patients ciproprophylaxis and isoprovir um, as the current practice in uh, neutropenic patients, using fluconazole as antifungal prophylaxis, and giving patients a year of back trim. The last part is about long-term clinical monitoring in terms of hypogamma globulinemia, prolonged cytopenias, and potential risk because of the potential risk of secondary malignancies from genotoxicity or the use of replication computer viral vectors. And hence, these patients need to be monitored long-term. What we hope to achieve in our patients is this. This is the patient um, pre uh, RT cell therapy where we see in a PET scan there is um, extensive disease. And after CAR T cell therapy, together with radiation, the patient, despite the period of uh, CRS, went on to have a recovery of a full T cell repertoire and disease eradication. I, I think there cannot, can't be a talk um, in terms of practical delivery of CAR T cell without talking about the cost of CAR T cell therapy. We get this question very often. And of course, I do not deny that at this point of time, CAR T cell therapy is expensive and it's still not available to the masses. However, this is not a problem that we are facing alone in Singapore. And I think worldwide, we are making some small steps um, in terms of um, getting this better to and made more available to our patients. In terms of cost, it's not just a simple um, single time cost to our patient. We also talk about the value of the therapy itself. And if we can reach a point where we increase the value and cut down the cost, that is when we can um, benefit more patients. How I address this topic is through a few things. Um, of course, we want to improve outcomes. We want to make manufacturing and scalability better such that we can bring, and in, eventually to bring down direct costs to patients. In terms of improving outcomes, we need better predictors of response and failure. And in patients who are destined to failure, perhaps CAR T cell therapy is not suitable for them to make better use and justification of our resources. We also need to have better time points. I think we are having some initial um, guidance on this. This is a typical clinical progression chart of patients with myeloma that I think a lot of us uh, hematologists are familiar with. Patients are treated and as they relapse, the, disease, the duration of remission de decreases. They get uh, more refractory to treatment. And at point of time, they are resistant and refractory to all kinds of treatment. I think this mirrors a lot, the cause of a lot of different cancers when it comes to relapses. And hence, if I could use some diagram to show this, patients are treated and as they relapse, we give them intensive different kinds of salvage treatment therapy the period of remission shortens with each time. And at a point of time now, they, they become refractory to treatment and are non, no longer salvageable. In the first relapse setting in the LBCL and in the newly diagnosed myeloma setting, usually we do what we call autologous stem cell transplants. This prolongs the period of remission in certain patients. However, in um, the vast majority or in the majority of patients, the disease does relapse again and we go through this period of salvage treatment. There is a proportion of patients where through the use of autologous stem cell transplant, they can remain in disease-free remissions. And of course, I think in this group, they should, if we can identify them well, they should continue with standard of care. What CAR T cell does um, is that it hopes to achieve in the relapse setting, this what we call uh, disease-free remission. And hence, patients may not uh, require continuous infusions because it is purported as a living drug being exp expanding and per persisting in the patient's body. Hence, the cost then will be compared. As we know, in the relapse setting, the cost of um, frequent infusions might be uh, expensive as well. And in a CAR T cell setting, it is thus compared as such. Uh, why we, we find difficulty in um, justifying the cost of CAR T cell therapy is because it is hard for us to predict whether the patient will really have this period of disease-free remission. And if the disease was to relapse quickly, then um, the value or the cost of CAR T cell therapy cannot be justified as well. We are having some initial uh, readouts with regards to this. I think in ESCO this, just in ESCO this year, there is some readout about silver cell versus real world standard of care. Um, I don't have any uh, randomized control trial results at this point of time now. But as you can see, they compared about 100 patients treated with CAR T cell in the myeloma setting with a real world cohort. Um, this standard mean deviation is very, very small, meaning that they are relatively comparable. And in terms of progression free and survival and overall survival, we can see that CAR T cell greatly outweighs that of the real world uh, patients in the relapsed refractory setting. The second point that we want to look at is, in fact, using CAR T cell at an earlier time point. And perhaps if we can prolong the remission and prevent relapses, this gives us two benefits. 
first, that the cost we are comparing with is that with the transplant together with the relapse treatments. And there is also a treatment free quality of life. We are starting to have a little bit more understanding with regards to this. Um, although I don't have any um, data results to show, you can see this from recent press releases uh, of the TRANSFORM which uh, study, which is uh, a phase three study comparing the efficacy of lysocell to standard of care in patients with high risk transplant eligible uh, relapse refractory B cell lymphomas. And also from Zuma 7, which is a phase three study of XSL and also uh, relapse refractory um, DLBCL. So the, well, from both um, back to back press releases, we can see that there is a highly statistically significant improvement in terms of event free survival, response rates, and progression free survival. The press release um, on just a few days ago also said that XSL improved event free survival by 60% over chemotherapy plus stem cell transplant in second line relapse or refractory DLBCL. My Loma follows closely behind. Karma 4 study and CAR T2 5 study are now ongoing to investigate the use of CAR T cell therapy in high risk um, newly diagnosed settings. So then it comes down to this point where we want to try and pick out the patients who, are, um, who have higher chances of relapsing in the future post stem cell therapy and trying to use this justify for using CAR T cell therapy in a more upfront setting. The second part about addressing costs is through manufacturing and scalability in terms of increasing manufacturing efficacy uh, through economies of scale. If we, of course, use it more often, the economies of scales would, would say that the treatment cost might decrease. And of course, to try and use local production. Uh, certain methods to use to look into this, including using non-viral approaches such as the sleeping beauty um, transposase-based systems to try and cut down the treatment, um, the, the manufacturing use duration. As we know, there are certain automated approaches such as the Miltani Clinimax Prodigy system, which allows for point of care production and cuts down the process time to about 14 days. And also the use of allogenic cars. This was presented um, at ASH last year. Um, this is the anti-BCMA allogenic CAR T cell therapy, uh, where interestingly, they um, locked out CD52 and PCR in, the fish, um, in allogenic T cells. What this does is that it allows for the use of um, CD52, administration of CD52, to allow for lymphodepletion, prevent graft rejection, and also the knockout of the tract gene minimizes the risk of GVHD. Uh, in the allogenic setting, this bypasses the need of going through the whole personalized autologous pathways and will definitely cut down the cost of therapy. And there are initial readouts to say that it has shown to be effective in certain patients, as can be seen by the green lines in showing patients who have attained CR. The last part is the direct cost to patients. Uh, we talk about patient access programs, philanthropic funds for patients who require it most. And I think worldwide, we are starting to look at innovative payment schemes, such as outcome-based reimbursement of payments. I think the issue with cost of CAR T-cell is that it's a, lump, a huge lump sum that makes it very uh, unaccessible to most patients. And hence, there are some centers which are, which are looking at outcome-based payments, which means that patients who um, benefit the most or patients who are able to be treated and remain disease-free for one, two years or so on, end up paying higher costs than those who are not. Of course, this needs a lot of discussion and uh, innovation before we can proceed with such. So our CAR T-cell journey at SGH, I brought out a team and I can say that I cannot do this without um, a lot of other parties involved. We have a huge team of um, hematologists, transplanters, um, who are all in this journey together. We also have a huge team of coordinators, nursing support, pharmacists, and so on. And I cannot um, put them all into this slide. And with that, um, we have set up a few centers and come together, um, Cell Therapy Center, the Blood Cancer Center, Transplant Center, to deliver this in a practical sense to our patients. I show an example of a patient, uh, one of our patients who had um, relapsed DLBCL, uh, transformed follicular to DLBCL. He had his leukophoresis done and received his CAR T cell therapy in about January this year. During the course of his stay, he had grade three CRS, but he recovered well after the use of tocilizumab. Um, uh, the flow of the CAR T cells detectable in the blood showed good expansion of the CAR T cell. And now he's about six months. There is still some persistence of CAR T cells in the blood. And this was his recent PET scan done just a couple, uh, just a couple of days ago. And I'm glad to say that he's still in remission with a Duvel score of one. And we can see that how CAR T cell has benefited some of our patients. So here I would say that despite the significant financial, regulatory, and administrative barriers, we have learned much through the best practices of experience at this. The establishment of CAR T-cell programs through careful planning and deployment actually can be done here in Singapore. But we need cross-talk with a multidisciplinary team 
to, be deliv to deliver these CAR T cells safely to our patients and to bring about its tremendous benefit. The last part is, I will just touch on how I vision us moving forward. This paper summarizes it quite nicely in that the success of CAR T cells has propelled the commercial launch of this class of therapeutics, but to realize the full potential of CAR T cell will require parallel scientific programs, progress to address primary and secondary resistance and also addressing challenges relating to affordability and scalability. We summarize it into two um, portions. One is to address the resistance and persistence, and the second is to address the cost and improving manufacturer processes. So I think just now in the introduction, I spent a year at MSKCC and I saw how they did it there. And um, of course, this is one of the visions that we have. They have a huge preclinical team um, developing CAR T cells preclinically, sending them for manufacturing, and then bringing the, translating them into the clinics. From the clinics, they de develop a lot of correlatives, gone back to the preclinical setting and try to improve them. What this means is that they start off with novel targets, uh, go through the manufacturing in their facilities and go through the regulatory bodies, subsequently translating them in terms of clinical trials to the clinic um, and also discussion to many cell therapy meetings. They derive clinical correlatives to predict responses, failures, and correlate for toxicities and bring this back into the bench setting to improve upon the targets they have um, developed upon. Just a quick sharing. So this is, uh, this is from my, um, my mentor who was there. Um, so firstly, he developed this BCMA targeted CAR T cell vector. He went about um, to prove that um, certain vectors uh, have shown um, cytotoxicity in the bench setting. They went on to use these uh, vectors in clinical trials. Um, these are a few trials, um, the main one being the EVOLVE study, a uh, multi-institutional uh, trial, and subsequently published some data. So this has gone on to be developed commercially as OVACEL. They determine clinical correlatives, predictors of response and resistance, and also publish papers in terms of um, clinical correlates. At the same time, they also went to look for further targets because we know that um, tumor escapes is a mechanism of resistance and failure. So another target they were looking at is GPRC5D. For this, they are doing the clinical trial for um, anti-GPRC5D uh, anti CAR T cell, and also further developed um, together with the BCMA to define optimal dual targeting approaches. So combining BCMA and GPRC5D through both um, the put approaches and the tendon approaches, as well as the single stop approaches, they went on to show that the tendon approaches um, is beneficial. Um, it can mitigate tumor, uh, it, 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 it can mitigate antigen negative tumor escapes in a sense, and upfront tumor targeting might be an optimal approach in some patients. So with that, how I vision us to run a clinical CAR T cell program. Of course, usually we start with having the background the regulation, the accreditation, the training, the education, and of course, setting the reimbursements in place and use routine CAR T cell or commercial CAR T cells. We also depend on industry clinical trials, but as we move further along, um, we build upon our preclinical research team and translational research team of which Actris has um, done a great part and has partnered with a lot of us in trying to get this through. And with a hope of bringing forward academic clinical trials or IITs in a sense to benefit our patients, and of course, people talk about spin outs. That's uh, the scope of this talk. So, with that, I end to say that um, the scientific community can come together to ensure sustainability in delivering CAR T cell therapy in Singapore and to realize its full potential. It will include addressing issues related to mechanisms of resistance and persistence of CAR T cell, as well as in addressing practical challenges relating to affordability and scalability. The whole CAR T cell can, um, administration to patients cannot be done with a whole village or a whole city, in fact. And with that, I'd like to thank a lot of uh, people in my department, the transplant team, and also the cell, Cellular Therapeutic Center, and also my mentors and friends at MSKCC who have taught me a lot. Thank you. I'll take some questions. Thank you so much for uh, Dr. Chen's uh, your presentation. Now, yeah, now it's time for Q and A. I think there are already a couple of questions in the Q and A tab. Dr. Okay. Chen, uh, would you like to? Yeah, sure. So uh, I just go through some of the list. How does allogenic cell therapy developing compared to autologous therapy? Will allogenic reduce much of the challenges compared to autologous? So. Um, Plus minus, I don't think we have um, a lot of um, data to support this at this point of time. I think allogenic reduces the challenges in terms of um, the, the logistical network because allogenic can be mass produced in that sense. Um, it doesn't need to be personalized as in the, the, the cells do not need to be collected from the patients. 
manufactured and then administered back to the patients. And hence, it is more like a commercial product in that sense. However, there are some issues with allogenic cell therapy that are not addressed. Some people still worry about the risk of graft versus host disease. But as I mentioned, there are ways to look into it. Um, in terms of the previous trials, they um, edit out the track gene as well as the as well as um, CD52, such that you can infuse CD52 to get rid of the lymphocytes in the patients themselves to prevent graft rejection. So that's not this. Uh, we wait for further results, and of course, it's an exciting field. How much would a CAR T cell therapy be in Singapore? So in Singapore, the CAR T cell therapy current commercial product, uh, together with the collection process, is about it, it exceeds five hundred thousand dollars. Um, it's about almost six hundred thousand dollars. There's a few on allogenic CAR which I have considered. So any role for CAR T cell therapy in solid tumor? I think there definitely will be a role in the future. Um, there are a lot of unanswered questions. There is a lot of development in this area. And I think with the experience we have had with hematological malignancies, this field, we can only await uh, further developments. Of course, there have been some initial um, um, trials, initial studies. The, the inefficacy lies in the fact that um, I think a lot of times it's the tumor microenvironment, but um, with increased uh, knowledge and increased trials, we can do better. And I'm sure this is another exciting field to look at. What critical att quality attributes of the manufactured CAR T cells do you monitor before and administering to patients? And are these correlations between clinical outcomes and quality attributes of CAR T cells administered? So, um, usually for for the manufactured CAR T cells, prior to the manufacture itself, uh, we do undergo some stringent uh, count checks to see whether they are suitable. After that, it goes to the manufacturing side. Of course, there are certain uh, qualities or certain measures that we need to look at in terms of virus uh, load, um, in terms of infective um, checks. And, and they also need to meet a certain quantity before we can administer them to patients. Are these correlations between clinical outcomes and quantity? Is it quality? Quality attributes of T cells being administered. I think at this point of time now, we do not have enough guidance. Um, there are some centers which are looking at the, uh, the ratio of CD4, CD8, um, and, and how to a uh, 50 50 ratio might benefit patients. Uh, so we wait for further re uh, results before we can give further guidance on this. So how is the CAR T cells currently manufactured in Singapore? Is it sent overseas to manufacturer sites or are there currently facilities in-house options to make the final CAR T cell products for administration? I think it's both ways. Currently our commercial product is sent overseas um, to Morris Plains in the US for manufacture. Uh, most of the commercial still keeps their manufacturing sites um, to a select few. So usually it's, there's still a transport pathway involved. For our in-house academic products, um, it's usually manufactured in Singapore. Of course, we work closely with HSA and Actress uh, to try to get this through to our patients. We hope that um, as we build up our experience, Singapore can, can take the lead in terms of CAR T cell manufacturing. And in comparison between local and overseas, of course, in the local setting, the transport cost is cut down. And we hope that if we can scale it up and make it very efficient, we can be able to give this cost savings directly to our patients. Are the frozen CAR T cells thought and directly introduced into the patient, or are, allow, are they allowed to acclimatize in vivo conditions in a suitable medium? Um, usually they are thought in suitable media that can be directly infused to patients, but they are thought and then infused to patients. They change media in that sense, because it will introduce another point of um, introduction of infections. Are there trends towards more on-site manufacturing at hospitals? We hope so. So there are certain, um, for example, the Clinimax uh, Prodigy machine that can be point of care um, systems that we can allow for on-site manufacturing in hospitals. What are the main challenges in your opinion? Mix product and product differs. In terms of getting a product to the patient, we need a period of validation. It's the, the, the products that are FDA approved are now currently it, um, like approved in terms of using their own manufacturers. And hence, we cannot 
use the vectors and manufacture it using a different system. And with that, they have to go through different systems of validation. So it's not so, it's a challenge in terms of um, trying to bring the manufacturing directly to our hospitals. Hope that answers that question. I have answered the okay. Questions. Sure. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, just uh, one last time to ask the floor if you have any more questions for Dr. Chen. Okay. I think that's all. Um. Oh, there's one more Sorry. from Manfred. Any thoughts of the impact of cryo preservation of PBMCs on the impact of CAR T cell manufacturing, especially so if the manufacturing has occurred. Sorry, I read it out. Hello, Dr. Chen. Many thanks for the insightful presentation. Any thoughts on the impact of cryopreservation of PBMCs on the impact of CAR T manufacturing, especially so if the manufacturing has a capacity constraint or is located in another part of the world? Uh, I know overseas centers have done this to compare whether or not the uh, impact of freezing down the cells has, a, has an impact of both the quality and quantity of the, on the PBMCs and the T cell expansion. So far, it doesn't seem to be so, and it can still be used in a sense, but um, we are also trying to look into this. Uh, and there are centers which does it fresh in that sense. Uh, and of course, as we know, thawing does have it, freezing and thawing does have it, definitely have an impact on cells. Uh, but because of the fact that the cells are subsequently expanded and give, give rise to an increased quantity in that sense, it, it makes up for it. We would always want to try and bring down the transport time and get patients fresh cell as much as possible. But at this point of time, because of logistical constraints, we are still done in the frozen and thought method. So what are the average fundings from the Singapore government towards further development of CAR T or cell therapies in general? <laughs> I think it's quite a hard question for me to answer average funding. The government has been relatively supportive um, in setting up of Chris actress um, to sort of um, mitigate the current cell therapy landscape and to help us in terms of clinicians trans work better with scientists in terms of clinical translation. So of course, we are very thankful for that. Funding wise, it still depends a lot on individuals to apply grants to fund um, clinical trials to further develop CAR-T or cell therapies in general. Uh, at this point of time now, because it is um, extremely costly, I don't think there is a reimbursement in that sense for individual patients for the receiving of rece receiving CAR T cells. But as we know better and judge better that it's cost uh, versus benefits uh, ratio, we can we look to having better discussions and trying to help more patients. So for overseas manufacturers, which authority in Singapore will need to A credit the manufacturer. So usually in um, Singapore, HSA still holds the legislation, um, the, the key to the legislation. Uh, most of the time we still follow the um, Cell Therapy and Gene Products Act and make sure that they have fulfilled certain minimum requirements before allowing them to, to, to be uh, administered to patients. HSA will, 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 will We'll do the final approvals of to whether these drugs are approved to be used in patients. So I think it's a, the Health Sciences Authority is the one who does the accreditation and the approvals for overseas manufacturers. Great. I think that's about all the questions that we have anymore. If not, we are coming to the end of the lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen, for your time and for your presentation. And I'm sure all of us enjoy Dr. Chen's presentation. Thank you and uh, we'll end this time and uh, hope to see you and the rest again next Thank time. You. Take care. Bye-bye everyone.
Thank you.